Ladies and gentlemen, can you please take your seats as this session is about to begin? Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this plenary session, which is Scaling Up and Financing Innovation. I'd like to also say a very warm welcome to those that are joining us from Pretoria in South Africa, which is being hosted by the Department of Science and Technology, as well as those that are joining us from Addis, and that is being uh, hosted by the Ministry of Science and Technology in Ethiopia. Those of you that are joining us through YouTube, uh, the AIS website, and the AIS app. A very warm welcome to all of you. My name is Tracy Webster. I'm the CEO of Enterprise Room, and I'm also an Archbishop of Desmond Tutu Fellow, and I'm going to be your moderator for this session. Now, this is a topic that is very close to my heart because uh, we at Enterprise Room dedicate our whole life to walking alongside innovators and entrepreneurs, those that are looking to commercialize, those that are at that early uh, startup stage, and those that are looking to scale. And we spend a lot of time helping them uh, find market opportunities, accessing finance, uh, taking over their, 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 their back office function, helping them with compliance. And believe you me, uh, their pain is our pain. And I do believe we have quite a painful topic to discuss this afternoon. Uh, but helping me navigate this topic, I have a fantastic panel compromising of experts and innovators, uh, and I believe we're going to have a very rich conversation. But what I want out of my panelists today is for you to give us practical examples, um, and you all represent various different areas of the ecosystem. So I'm looking to you to show us how you've used innovation in your particular area of expertise. Now, yesterday afternoon on uh, the afternoon plenary, uh, OB said this, what governments need is the crazy ones, the visionaries who are the most, uh, who are not scared to think big and try new things. So joining me on the panel this afternoon, we do have one of those crazy ones. Uh, we like to think of the crazy ones as the innovators. So I'd like you to uh, join me in welcoming uh, Christina Duart, who was the former finance minister of Cape Verde. Uh, I would also like to say a very, very warm welcome. Thank you. I would also like to welcome Regis Rugamanshuro, who is the CEO of BK Tech House. What strikes me about you, however, is that you're a very young CEO. And uh, what that sets up in my mind, um, and I have an expectation already, is that you're very innovative. And I hope that you can show how the bank's approach to banking low-income customers and uh, understanding their risk profile could be slightly different. That is my expectation. Thank you. Rory, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> then we have Rory Moore, who is an innovator, he's a lecturer, and he's building out the innovation capability at Accenture, helping the private sector to innovate. Well, isn't that going to be a good thing? Looking forward to hearing how that's going. Thank you. And then, finally, Marmadou Tore, who I believe needs no introduction. The way I see him is one of Africa's finest pioneers and innovators. He is the chairman and CEO of Ubuntu Capital, uh, a leading investment and an advisory firm. Thank you. So I'm not going to spend too much detail in unpacking uh, what Africa requires, but I think we all know that in order for Africa to realize its full potential, uh, Africa really needs to be innovating at absolutely every level and every sector of society. Uh, we need to be building uh, large companies that can uh, compete at a global level. Um, and, and certainly, I, I want to respond to what Simba had to say on the opening panel yesterday. He said, wouldn't it be great in a few years from now, we were coming together um, as the African Innovation Summit to celebrate our innovators who had built amazing homegrown African companies that were competing on a global level and changing 
uh, and providing solu solutions for global challenges. And the only way we're going to achieve that is if we come alongside our innovators and we understand what they require in order to go to scale so that we can realize that vision. I hope uh, today we're going to come out with some insights, some solutions, and that in a few years from now, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be celebrating these global players. I thought it would be interesting, just uh, by way of backdrop, uh, to, to, to share with you some of the insights that we gathered from over 600 applications that we received to participate in the exhibition here at the Africa Innovation Summit. As you know, we selected 50, but we had uh, applications from 44 different African countries. And one of the questions we asked in the application is, what is hindering you from going to the next level of your business? What is hindering you uh, from going to scale? And so I wanted to, to set that as a backdrop for our discussion today. Obviously, one of the things they said is access to finance is a real enabler to scaling. But we drilled into that in a little bit more detail. What they require financing for is operational efficiencies, resourcing, salaries, premises, land, storage facilities, technologies, um, uh, 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 vehicles, uh, machinery, equipment. Those are the kinds of things that they're looking uh, uh, for financing for. Um, and in particular, they're, they're wanting to uh, finance the type of skills that they require in their businesses. So they're looking for real experts, the engineers, uh, the, the technology um, uh, the technology skills that they require in their own businesses in order to take them to the next level. Uh, not m too many banks I know want to uh, fund somebody's salaries. Uh, the other thing they said is access to markets. And what I found interesting about this is that there were two points they made. Uh, they need marketing, advertising, and distribution channels. Uh, I'm not sure the last time I, I know when a, a bank said, let me put up my hand and, um, and finance a marketing strategy. That was on the one side, but the other thing was access to markets, cross-border markets. And there's a lot of regulation around that uh, that is preventative from them scaling over the borders. And, and they really wanted that addressed as well. They want to be able to set up uh, franchisees across the border. They really, really want to scale um, across the continent, but, but there's so many regulatory things that are inhibiting them from doing that. Uh, the other thing, uh, obviously, was around technology. They, they are pioneers, they are uh, innovators, and they're needing uh, business intelligence, analytics, automation, uh, machinery, all of these kinds of things to really get them to the next level. Uh, these are expensive and are prohibiting them from, from scaling up. R&D, I think there's been a lot said already around that. And then the other thing they spoke about was infrastructure. I think we also already know that. A lot of their consumers are in more rural communities and the roads and the infrastructure is inhibiting them from them actually reaching their consumers. Now, they're quite happy to innovate over uh, through this, uh, whether it's through drone technology or whatever it is. Our innovators aren't scared of some of these hurdles, but uh, is government keeping up with the policies to enable this to happen? A lot of the feedback was, we feel like we are going ahead at a, at a rapid rate, innovating, but is everyone keeping up with us in terms of their innovation? And then the other thing I thought was really interesting was they spoke about the consumer. And um, for some of them, their products and services are specifically designed uh, to lower income households. So who is actually coming around uh, those consumers uh, with financial solutions to enable them to take up and buy some of their goods and services? So uh, I think that that was good insights from um, our entrepreneurs and specifically again on the skills. Are we skilling up uh, the workforce in a relevant way that's going to be able to be plugged into my business? So on that note, I'm going to start off with Christina Duart, um, and, and I also just want to position something else. I loved it when Carlos Lopez yesterday said on his panel, there are so many naysayers, there are so, there's so much negativity. If all we ever say about ourselves is we're not manufacturing, we're not doing this, government's not doing this, and we just keep complaining, uh, no one will ever see the positive impact, um, and we need to focus on that today. So I actually want to inspire you with every sector that actually is utilizing innovation. 
And I want to hear the impact from our experts up here because we're here to inspire what can happen when innovation is applied to all that you do in every sector. So over to you, Christina. I'm curious to know, during your tenure as finance minister at Cape Verde, um, how did the leadership of the country apply innovation to drive the, the, the growth of Cape Verde? Uh, and what were some of those key outcomes? What was the impact of that? Good afternoon to, uh, to everybody. After lunchtime is a, is a delicate period. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's, and thank you, Tracy, for the, uh, your brilliant introduction. Thank you, thank Thanks. you very, thank you very much. From a policy making, I have a couple of uh, ideas that I'd like to put on the table. The first one is that for policy making to be able to create an ecosystem for innovation, policy makers need to be themselves innovators. If they are not innovators, they will be unable to create this ecosystem for innovation. So when you analyze policy making and innovation, I believe we need to do it on a double dimension. First, policy makers as innovators themselves. Second, the, the fact that policy makers are responsible for creating the ecosystem for innovation. So my presentation, my seven minutes presentation, I will discuss these two main issues, policy makers as innovators and our responsibility to create the ecosystem for innovation. In the case, as you request in your introduction, let's analyze the case of Cape Verde. Um, as Minister of Finance um, and in the government in general, we did innovate in Cape Verde. We did innovate. And I'd like to give you an example of, uh, with the Minister of Finance. Uh, what we did, basically, and I will not be too much technical, we managed to re-engineering the, the expenditure side of the budget. We did the same on the revenue side of the budget and also in terms of treasury management. In this, my seven minutes first intervention, I will not go in details. If someone wants to understand how this engineering has been done, I can respond to any, any question. But by doing this re-engineering or this budget re-engineering, what do we manage to do? We manage to incorporate off-budget expenditures and off-budget uh, revenues. And this is very critical because off-budget expenditures and off-budget revenues, usually they are related to vested interests. So it's a change that you need to touch vested interests. What you did, in short, we, we, did, we rework the flows, so we put on the table new workflows. With these new workflows, we create new functions, and we apply the segregation function principles to the workflow. And basically, in short, of course, this, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you in two sentences, a reform that took me 10 years. <laughs> so uh, basically, at the end of this process, we managed to put a reconfigurator PFM system on the table. So a reconfigurated public finance management system on the table. And suddenly, I start realizing as Minister of Finance that having a completely reconfigurating, uh, reconfigurated PFM system, this reconfiguration actually starts working as a source of credibility. Why? Because this new PFM system increase in a very significant way the level of accountability and the level of transparency in the budget management in Cape Verde. And what we did with this credibility that has been actually has been a result of an innovation. We basically transformed this credibility in export merchandise. Because, as you know, credibility is an intangible asset. K 
Cape Verde has no commodities, has no traditional natural resources to export, so we transform credibility in export merchandise stamped by the Bretton Woods institutions, IMF, World Bank, European Commission and African Development, African Development Bank, and you manage to mobilize huge amounts of concessional financing. And everything starts with the innovation in the PFM system. I would, I would like to say at this stage that I'm just giving the opposite example of the subject of this plenary, because this is financing for innovation. In my case, I use innovation for financing. I use innovation to mobilize financial resources for, for Cape Verde. I believe that um, accountability and transparency in Africa is no longer an option for policymakers. It's no longer. Because in the past 20 years, most of the African countries invest in education. So this investment in education um, result in the emergence of a, a middle class mm -hmm. and very highly assertive civil societies, making accountability and transparency an imperative, no longer an option for, for, uh, so for policymakers. Of course, to conduct this process, to reach this level, there, there were four ingredients, very short. First, a strong leadership to manage change. Second, this process cannot be outsourced. It's not, it's not a package, sorry, that you buy to an international consulting company for 1,000 bucks and you just plug in your process and systems in your country. It needs to be a made in house Cape Verde. And this made in house process. And in the case of Cape Verde, it was a made in Cape Verde made in Cape Verde process. Fourth, the reason that it cannot be outsourced and yes, to be made in ours, made in Cape Verde, is the only way that at the end of the process, you have the necessary, the necessary ownership over your process and over your, your systems. The second dimension, policymakers as, as in charge as the one responsible for creating the ecosystem for innovation. In the case of Cape Verde, what we did? First, of course, it's clear that all this, sorry, all this revolution in terms of e-governance in Cape Verde generates lots of spillovers for the rest of the society. Yeah. It was just amazing. And what we did, for, I, I can give you an example. For example, this e-governance in Cape Verde stimulate the acquisition of knowledge in the ICT sector, changing the, or, or allowing the emergency of new competence in the labor market in, in Cape Verde. But in order to create the ecosystem, what we did in Cape Verde, we start with a vision. You have to have a vision in order to create an ecosystem for the innovation. And our vision in Cape Verde was to create an information and a knowledge society. That was our starting point in order to create this, this, this ecosystem. So we believe, and we still believe, that by creating or by, by building an information and knowledge society, we can, uh, this information society can work as a catalyzer to unlock and scale up innovation skills. This was our starting point. And we did something I believe very original from an e-governance standpoint. We put the citizen and the companies as the epicenter. We analyze the life cycle of a company. And all the systems, all the products that we create, were created taking account the company's life cycle or taking account the citizen life cycle, not how the government was organized by departments and ministries. Actually, based on this approach, we had to change our structure and to adapt to the life cycle of companies and to adapt to the life cycle of, of companies. In addition, we create what we call NOSI, which is the information society arm of the government. And with the money that we managed to mobilize 
through con uh, concessional financing. What we did, we infrastructure, of course, we channel a huge amount to innovation. Okay. We channel a huge amount to innovation. Just to give you an example, we cover Cape Verde with, with a, a technology called WiMAX. We transform Cape Verde in a Wi-Fi country. And we managed to provide free internet in every central square uh, in each municipality in the country. Meaning that any people, particularly young people, could go to these central squares in each municipality and to connect for free and to access information and knowledge. So this is why we start building, building our information society and our knowledge and knowledge society. But in the case in Cape Verde, you use information to get money, and then with this money, we bring value again to innovation. Thank you, Tracy. Excellent. <laughs> And that was one of the things that came through in our data is that a lot of the innovators were saying access to Wi-Fi is one of the things that's going to fundly, fundamentally shift things forward. Um, and the other one was then around educating um, education as well and, and ensuring that school have, schools have access uh, to Wi-Fi so we can up the, the learning game. And I think that's something that Cape Verde did. And off the back of um, implementing Wi-Fi, suddenly you started changing the efficiencies of healthcare, bringing uh, telemedia into the country, etc. So, just by by um, that that infrastructure, laying that infrastructure, the impact of that uh, was was huge in, in every sector, be it education or, or be it healthcare as well. Yes, we manage with the once we covered the country with this WiMAX uh, technology. We managed to bring uh, the connectivity to each school. Yes. And we managed to bring connectivity to each health center. And after doing that, the next step, for example, in the, in the health sector, and take, and take into account that Cape Verde is a 10 island uh, country, we, um, we adopt telemedicine. We adopt telemedicine. Um, by 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 bringing uh, connectivity to each school. For example, I know that uh, uh, the government today is um, implementing a very interesting project called Web Lab, which is um, bringing robot, robotic knowledge to schools, uh, programming knowledge to schools. So based on this infrastructure, I believe that Cape Verde is, re is, is, is ready for the next generation in terms of innovation in the education, in, in the health sector, and the other sectors. Excellent. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to, to Regis, uh, typically commercial banks have a particular risk po profile, um, and hence low, the lower income people are excluded from access to finance. Now, I'm curious to know how Bank of Kigali innovated to reach smallholder farmers. Could you tell us that story? Sure, thank you very much, Tracy. And great, great speech, that was really good. I think that's a lot of country need to have in place uh, to, to get uh, to great. the innovation we need. Um, maybe before I dive in a little bit, let me give some context of how we actually arrived. Um, uh, you know, Rwanda have, has been having many of these conferences. One of them, Jack Ma actually attended. He said something that kind of marked many of us who attend. He said, help young people, help small guys, because small guys will be big, Young people will have the seeds you bury in their minds, and when they grow up, they will change the world. So, all right. Excellent. So at Bank of Kigali Group, we really believe in that philosophy. And we're not just walking, uh, talking the talk, we're actually walking the talk. And some of the things we're doing, besides investing in a company like BK Tech House, which we are uh, one of the subsidiaries that compose uh, Bank of Kigali Group, uh, we also invest in uh, outside young entrepreneurs. Uh, every year, uh, starting last year, we invest 60 million francs uh, into young entrepreneurs. Uh, we take them through a boot camp uh, of seven months, and the top 10 selected, uh, not only they know how to manage a business, create a business plan, 
market their company um, network with investors, but also if they qualify to the final round, they receive a, a, a fund or a grant of zero interest. Uh, so on that side, we're, not, we're doing it so that because we believe in them. It's not charity as a CSR, as many might think. It's because we really strongly believe that young people uh, can innovate. Um, and thinking ahead, it's not like all they really want is opportunity and someone to believe in them. Now, besides that, uh, we also innovate from within, uh, which is, the, by essence, the existence of BK Tech House. Uh, BK Tech House is a company set up to disrupt the current model of the existing bank. We are the biggest commercial banks, uh, bank in the country, by asset and by market share. But we believe that the future is digital. And for that, for us to remain relevant and competitive in a digital world, we have to create what we like to call digital consumers. Um, and our slogan became powering innovation because we knew we had to power innovation nationally to make sure we can get there, uh, not only for the BK as our ecosystem, but also for the country as a whole. Um, wondering how did we do that, right? Uh, the, the specific case about small farmers. When we were looking around to see how can we significantly uh, raise financial inclusion, for instance? How can we really promote cashless economy and green economy and get from the 21% where we are now, cashless, to 80% where the country wants to be in the, uh, by 2024? Uh, we looked at different sectors. We have platforms in education, agriculture, real estate, as well as healthcare. Really, if you I remember, we used to sit in a room brainstorming. We had to the uh, Maslow's pyramid of basic needs. Or what does someone need, right? If you want to help someone become a digital consumer, or meaning pick up a phone and do whatever task they need to do, you have to address their basic need, right? A farmer is not gonna pick up the phone to download the latest song of Serena Gomez, but if it's about picking up fertilizers and seeds or getting the best practice farming, they will do that if it's easy and affordable for them to do so. So that's exactly what we did. We realized that in Rwanda, as many it is many countries in Africa, 70% uh, of our people live for agricultural activities, right? And in Rwanda, it's about 30% of the GDP uh, every year. And, but what was shocking is when we looked at the number of the total amount of commercial loans allocated to agriculture, in 2016, it was 7.4%, according to the FinScope uh, report. 7.4%, right? And in 2017, it actually even went even lower, 5.2%. It doesn't make sense. I mean, you have the biggest part of the population uh, a consistent third of the GDP, yet nobody believes in them, nobody's giving them money. It didn't make sense if we wanted to solve that. And we came up with a concept called de-risking agriculture. Uh, de-risking agriculture in, in not only financially, but also from a talent perspective, right? Because Rwanda, we aspire to become, to move from the, uh, to become a more of knowledge-based economy. And if you have agriculture as the biggest part of the the, 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 the country, you really want to also find ways, how do we transform people to become knowledge workers rather than manual uh, labor? Um, so what we decided is to build a, a platform uh, that can help the government solve uh, some of the issues they are facing in actually uh, increasing efficiency, transparency, and productivity within agriculture itself. Um, and our philosophy uh, is simple as well, is, is, you know, to get what you want, uh, here I speak as, as, as financial institutions, to get what you want, you have to help others get what they want to get, right? So we, we, we found a niche, uh, an issue that was critically hurting the, 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 the institutions, you know, the delivery of inputs always being delayed, uh, farmers don't get it on time, which also uh, in, in impacts the harvest. And ultimately, if they got that loan, they're not going to be able to pay it, which again comes back to hurt them because farmers never pay back. Uh, farmers, we don't know what they do. Yet, as I, I can speak for myself, we all have uh, our grandparents and our grand grandparents were farmers. They raised generations, they put uh, kids to school, grad schools, sometimes a family of 10, going to school, they graduate, they start families farming, right? So they are really good at certain things, and that's what we wanted to capitalize on. So our platform, what it does in a nutshell, is um, in Rwanda there's a subsidized uh, agro-input uh, program where over two million farmers are eligible to receive uh, uh, specific agro-inputs and seeds to improve the harvest. So we built a platform that is going to digitalize the process that was before paperwork. And we brought on board financial institutions and insurance companies as well as private sectors. Uh, now, farmers uh, are registering. I'm very proud to say that as of today, starting March uh, 2017, uh, 2018, 
We have over 942,000 farmers registered today on the platform. Think of how many years. Thank you very much. And the only reason why people minimize the, the, the farmers sometimes, you know, but when there's an incentive, when you tell a farmer you're really good I mean, at, you know, you, you, at what you do, you might not have huge land, but you, if you have a family of four, only your kids are at school, and some of them are getting married, and you don't owe nobody money, by the way, right? The people with loans are the ones in town. These people have no loans, yet they're living their lives. So we told them exactly, keep doing what you're doing, but this time someone is paying attention. And if you continue to do so, we're willing to support you. And what we did now, the farmers have been registered, and we brought on board the financial institutions. We told them, look, we go guarantee, we're going to guarantee to you that the money you loan to these farmers uh, through our platform can only be used to buy agro inputs and fertilizers. And we brought in an insurance company. Uh, we're, so far, we're working with our insurance company, BK General Insurance, to say that if you get a loan from uh, any bank uh, to buy agro inputs, which you can, we guarantee that you'll only be paying, paying fertilizers and seeds and mechanization. Mm -hmm. If the farmer does everything they're supposed to do, the outcome is simple. If, assuming the conditions remain good, they should have a better quality and quantity in harvest. Uh, we also connect them with the post-harvest aggregator who buys from them and at a grid price, and they pay back the part of the loan. Now, if you, as a farmer, do everything you're supposed to do, and you got that loan, and it didn't rain, or it rained too much, now that micro-insurance is going to cover the part of the loan, paying back the bank, and also giving you enough money to afford seeds and fertilizers for the next season, right? And farmers were excited, and banks were very excited, and the insurance companies are very excited. And the private sector now, for once, they have direct access to the harvest. Uh, the farmers have direct access to the buyers, rather than depending on someone who go and tell some a, a cooperative in the, in, in, in the village that the kilo of potato is 150 when it's really 500, 500 francs in Kigali. And what we really wanted to put the farmer in the middle of the, the, the ecosystem is because when a farmer wins, when a farmer has power, to choose who he gets the loan from and who he sells his harvest from, everything goes down. The interest rates go down, the better terms and conditions. We're talking about over 2 million farmers expected. We have 942,000, but we're expecting about 1.5 million by, by end of July. Now, everyone with the numbers get really good. Everybody get excited. And now the farmer, the people who usually buy at a very high price, are willing to minimize to, to actually pay higher and what the farmers win. And, and for us, when we say we believe in the small guys, we believe in, in, in the youth, we plan events from which our ecosystem money grows up to two million, we want to bring all these young innovators who have ideas and uh, software products that can create value to the ecosystem, come plug and play. If it adds value and everybody wins, it's a win-win. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, if you have digital consumers, any of those farmers deal with us on the phone, right? We've trained about 20,000 facilitators. That's about one facilitator per 100 farmers. And I mean, we strongly believe that in the next few years, not only it's going to make agriculture cashless. You know, in Rwanda, transport is already cashless. We want to take it to agriculture being a cashless economy. But think of the impact from a social economic perspective when we manage to raise 5.2% allocated to agriculture to someone the 25%. You're changing people's lives, you're changing the GDP of the country, and that's what we hope for. So our slogan is powering innovation, and so far so good, we can't complain. Congratulations. Thank you. Very, very refreshing, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm now gonna uh, introduce uh, Rory, uh, Rory Moore. Uh, Rory Moore is an innovator um, and is working at Accenture building out their innovation capability. Uh, curious to know how the process is going in terms of working with um, the private sector to innovate. Uh, are you having to look at the entire culture? Um, just tell us a little bit more about that process. Thanks, Trace. Um, I think maybe what I could do is talk from a couple of perspectives. So Great. the first is from an Accenture perspective, which is obviously a corporate in the private sector. Um, the second is from the lessons I've learned from uh, lecturing leadership teams in the business schools. Um, and then thirdly, from the entrepreneurial perspective. So I've played in all these different worlds, which is, I think, quite a unique mix. So maybe if I tackle the first bit, uh, which is the lessons I've learned from my own experience in the corporate world, um, as well as... Um, lessons from people that are coming through the business schools. Um, and what I've picked up is that, scarily, uh, we are conditioned to play it safe. 
So management teams are conditioned to play it safe. Um, and that's about reducing risk and reducing uncertainty. Um, and whether this is because of shareholder expectations or whether it's because of management policy, we really try and make sure that we can play it safe. So we almost become schooled in playing it safe. And that's the, the, the sort of pervasive management doctrine. Um, but, you know, we, we, we almost become trapped in a system where you've got uh, these systems and procedures and uh, things in place, policies in place that uh, really uh, reduce the risk and uncertainty and aid us in predictability. Um, and ironically, that gives you, um, I mean, it gives you certainty, it makes you feel safe, but ironically, it makes you slow and sluggish and unresponsive at precisely the time when the world is speeding up, becoming faster, and we need to be more progressive, more dynamic, and more responsive. So we almost, we, we, it's ironic that the stuff that has stood us in good stead for so long is now completely outdated. Um, so I think if I just had to summarize the, um, the sort of corporate world and the, and the overriding corporate philosophy, essentially we have a, um, a management doctrine or a paradigm that really uh, is in place to prevent catastrophic failure. So that catastrophic failure we're trying to prevent also inhibits creativity and innovation. And what you'll find is that any good ideas kind of become stifled where the corporate antibodies actually kill off any good ideas. Not on purpose. People never actually try and kill off those ideas on purpose, but just the system in place prevents you moving forward. And we wonder why we can't embrace innovation. And it's obvious. So in this quest to, pre to prevent catastrophic failure and have predictability in a share price, we stifle innovation. So I've got a new philosophy. And that philosophy <laughs> is it's risky to play it safe. Or in other words, playing it safe is risky. So we need to be bold. And then from an entrepreneurial perspective, I think, yes, it's true. I think we do suffer from a skill shortage and many entrepreneurs complain around the fact that they can't find talent. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a skills shortage. And I think we have struggled uh, from an education perspective to produce graduates, um, to produce uh, the quality and quantity of graduates that are required to power our economy. Um, but I think there's an opportunity because the world is changing. And I think if you look at the classic model, or the, the traditional model of education that says you go through a three or four year degree and then you apply, you, with that learning you apply for the next 40 years and you retire at the end of that and you, you, know, you talk to your grandchildren. That model is finished, by the way. And then, you know, we, we, the reality is if you look at the new economy, which is powered by technology, um, if you are studying any kind of technology type degree, what you learn in your first year is outdated by the time you get to your third year, which means it's irrelevant. So we need to look at new ways of investing in education to power graduates for the future. And there's a lot of new models that we can, we can learn from already. So there's a, a new concept that has emerged called the nano degree. And the nano degree uh, is by uh, many people, one of the most famous is Udacity, um, out of the US, which really skills uh, people to be in the technology game, to be programmers, developers, uh, for Facebook, Google, and the like. Um, and the nano degree is a, is a couple of weeks, and it's a practical, hands-on course that allows you to become a developer straight away with the required skills at the right time. So if we can embrace that, then I think certainly we have a, a, an incredible opportunity. Um, and then lastly, I think we, we're looking at something which we call the gig economy. And the gig economy is really saying that you don't have to have one job for life. And in fact, you may have multiple jobs at the same time. You know, and this is that you may on Monday, you may have one job, Tuesday another job, or maybe it's mornings and evenings. You know, and we're seeing that people are doing this because the promise of a defined benefit pension has disappeared, which means we need to look after ourselves. So the gig economy says you can have many jobs at the same time and still be a productive uh, participant in the economy. Um, and lastly, I think the, the Liquid Studio is Accenture's big play into how we can invest into the future of these technologies. And we are pioneering and investing and playing in technologies like artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and blockchain. And these are exciting in their own right. But what really is, is interesting is that the product development cycle is actually really quick. So gone are the days of having you know, products developed in years or months, if you're lucky. Nowadays, you can produce products with these technologies in days or weeks, which is incredible. Um, and importantly, um, these technologies you can access on your phone, a feature phone or a smartphone, you can engage in it. And you may have already with OK Google or, or, or 
Siri, you can, you can engage these technologies. So it's here for us. The technology is there. You can actually engage, but also you can develop on your phone as well. So we don't need to sit back and make excuses about the fact that we can't access these things. It's there for us, and we can claim it. So in summary, I think the, what we need to encourage, embrace, employ, and grow are what I call misfits. These are the, hapster, the, hip, the hipsters, hackers, and hustlers that I think will pioneer the future. Excellent. Thank you. So, Mama Dutore, let's speak new technologies then. Um, <coughs> blockchain, cryptocurrencies, how will these impact financing as we know it? And will it play a role uh, in financial inclusion? And tell us a little bit more about your journey into cryptocurrency. Thank you, Tracy. Um, you know, I think maybe we want to put um, things in perspective and look at the trajectory of Africa or the planet in general over the coming century. There are five technologies that are going to be transforming the planet somehow or another. One is artificial intelligence. Second is biotechnology. Third, cybersecurity. Fourth is blockchain. And fifth is energy revolution. Now, if you look at artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and cybersecurity, they're all based on one thing, data. And blockchain in the middle of the five is the only technology today who can guarantee security, traceability of the data, right? So five of the technologies that are going to change, that are changing the world today and that will accelerate the world transformation will somehow or another have to rely on one of the other fourth, which is blockchain. Now, if you think of biotechnology, and it's interesting because I was, I was walking around uh, the stands and I saw some of the companies involved in that space. Um, you know, I like to say the last will be the first. Interestingly is uh, when you look at that, a lot of the biotech, and Africa has a very unique advantage there uh, for those innovators, is that we have ancestral knowledge, traditional knowledge. And if you see a lot of the pharmaceutical products, many of them are inspired from medicinal plants, etc., or traditional knowledge that Africa has to do. Now, if you put all of this on a blockchain, guess what? Intellectual property becomes a whole different story. Yeah? So, blockchain somehow then is at the center of this revolution, whether we want it or not, and we won't be able to stop it. It's here to stay. Now, Africa has a very unique opportunity there for the simple reason that today around the world you must have something like seven, maybe ten, max, thousand blockchain developers. Mm -hmm. For very first time in history, we have a very unique chance to catch up and leapfrog because 10,000 developers is not a big number to catch up with. Mm -hmm. And from a policy point of view and from a strategy point of view, it's a chance we can't afford to miss, mm -hmm. right? Now, when you think of blockchain financing and um, innovation, it leads me to talk, obviously, about cryptocurrency, right? So the Ubuntu coin, the Ucoin that we've put together aims exactly at that. How do we leverage on innovation um, to effectively bank the unbanked? As you know, out of the 1.2 billion people on the continent, close to a billion are unbanked or underbanked. It somehow shows that something needs to happen because banks didn't come on the continent yesterday. It's close to a century, if not more, right? Therefore, if we think of the fact that Africa has led the global trend on mobile banking, and we all remember M-Pesa of this world, we now are in a very unique position to lead, if we want to, if we commit to it, on the crypto revolution. And how, do, how can the crypto revolution help on financing? Think of this. Um, first, one of the challenges that, I mean, as you know, I've been in banking for close to 20 years, so one of the challenges um, is that the KYC, right? 
That's why the penetration is difficult. The second challenge is the cost of transaction. We're talking about sometimes $10, $15 per month between, with, between your credit card, running your bank account, et cetera. But for people who earn you know, $90 to $100, you know, 15 is a lot of money. That's why banking, they might share away. Second element, lending, right? SMEs and individuals have the biggest challenges in actually getting funding from banks because traditionally what we used to want as bankers was give a collateral. Where is your land? Um, does you, do, do your parents have something to give in collateral? Now, it's always a challenge, right? When you, start a, when you have a startup, you know, you, you not everyone has parents we've mentioned somewhere or we've land in the, you know, uh, to kind of give in collateral. So it is a challenge. Now, how, this is how technology can change things. And this is where um, Ucoin and cryptocurrency in general come in, is that you have also something very specific to Africa that you might find in some other emerging market is traditional social lending, right? So you have Stockfelds in South Africa, you have Tontine, that we have in Francophone Africa, and Emindi or Ekimindi, something like that in Rwanda, right? Sorry? Ekimina. Ekimina, thank you, right? So across the continent, at thousands of kilometers away, we have some of the same way to fund one another based on the solidarity, based on the Ubuntu principle, right? Now, put technology on that. You use the Ubuntu coin, the U coin, on a platform, you, on your mobile wallet, you have a cryptocurrency. Right? And you're part of this community, and someone within this virtual community needs money. Now you can transfer through this crypto, but now you have traceability on the blockchain and security. And you can now create a whole social lending mechanism. You can also work with banks, right, in making it happen. So banks are partners in this, right? So, but innovation leads the way. Um, the other important point is, you know, where the challenge that the banks have is KYC. Now, with digital identity, on the blockchain, you solve the problem, right? So, and that's where Africa has a very unique chance to leapfrog and, and grow, just to give you a sense about how mon mobile money has changed the, the face of the continent and how crypto put on it can actually accelerate. One, close to one third of the Kenyan economy moves through m size and the like. On the, now, that's if you take Ghana, for instance, last year, uh, well, you know, only seven years ago, um, um, let's say 10 if you, to be generous, mobile money was introduced, right? Um, and um, Ghana last year moved $35 billion through mobile phones from peer-to-peer, -peer, one person to person, sending money, paying bills, etc. And they don't necessarily all have the typical bank account the way you know it, and they don't go to... Uh, now, France, for instance, e-commerce industry, who's been there for 15, close to 20 years, um, was close to $70 billion for a population of 75 million people. Ghana has 25 million. So if you put the ratio, it, unless we're missing something, that's the way we should go. And that's where crypto comes again into place because it, it provides that security that you can effectively transfer and it, you can record. And what people are scared about when they hear about cryptocurrency is volatility. Yeah. Now, yes, Bitcoin can be a bit volatile. I'll give you that. But what we are doing with Ubuntu coin and Ucoin, it's an asset-backed cryptocurrency. And guess what Africa is rich of? Natural resources. And that's where suddenly, not only you have a, an actual virtual currency, but it's backed by something tangible that has a value on the market. And that's what we're offering to people. Now, beyond that, our model, like I said, is based on Ubuntu. And I'm, I was mentioning social lending. There are key values that are typical to this continent, what are our community base, etc. Ubuntu means I am because we are. So every owner of a Ucoin or Ubuntu coin owns micro shares of the company. And now you're moving again into innovation, not only be on technology, but on business model, innovation in, in societal shift. Right, and what, that's where I think Africa has a major role to play. And when you look at the, you know, the trade, and uh, Ubuntu coin is based on supporting the Afro-descendant community worldwide. What does that mean? From Dar es Salaam to Detroit, 
everyone in the community can now start trading and exchange. But what does it mean? Did you know that the biggest investor in Africa, way beyond foreign direct investment and private sector or aid or whatever you name it, is the diaspora. Last year it was $53 billion, right? So I think when you look into that, now tech entrepreneurs, innovators, they can use um, um, crowdfunding platform based on cryptocurrency and avoid the challenges of you know, foreign exchange, etc., and now start trading with one another. Um, and I think that's where the whole shift uh, and narrative can change. Now, the main challenge is that our currencies can be weak, right, um, and challenged or attacked in certain ways and depreciate. But if you use crypto beyond the, the dynamics of your nation, and you create a global, and you lead it, and you leave it to a global community with multiple economies. It's hard. It becomes very much harder to affect it, especially if it's asset-backed. And now you can lend from one community to another. Use the, use crowdfunding platform. I know I don't have much time left, but I'll make one last point, and that I've been coming within my three predecessors is knowledge-based society. This is the key for our transformation. We're talking about internet, etc. Now Singapore. South Korea based a model, and, K and Cape Verde over the past 10 years has done that and we saw the transformation. Did you know that the Estonia, for instance, is all running on digital? They learn to code from five year old. That's a very unique opportunity for Africa. All the Estonian government runs on blockchain. And guess what? We may not have the opportunity to kind of put big power plants together or you know, huge infrastructure. But that's something we can do tomorrow morning is get on a laptop, have internet, surf on it, build knowledge, and transact. And that's really where we have this unique chance. And this is really around, I was discussing with um, Ingrid yesterday, I'm, who's also one of the panelists, that. about the <laughs> Afrofuturism. It's very important that we start projecting ourselves within this dynamic. And cryptocurrency and Ucoin is really working towards that direction. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm now going to hand over uh, to the audience to please uh, ask our panelists questions, make statements. Maybe a, a woman would want to kick off the debate for a change. <laughs> I'm going to hand over to Ada. Ada? Do you have a mic? She's here. The Indian lady here. Great. Thanks, Thanks to everyone um, for your interventions. Um, my question very quickly to the last speaker, Mamadou. Can you speak a little bit more um, on your thoughts around how we handle the risk of um, this new world we're going into that's so dependent on data? Okay. Um, who is owning that data? Where is it kept if it disappears? You know, how are we really thinking through this um, with regards to innovation? It's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, so we are now moving, as you know, uh, what we people call fourth or third industrial revolution, to Internet of Things, right? But the shift that is happening is that data, historically, until a few months, was a monopoly of a few big corporations. Let's put it this way. Why? Because you would rely on whatever data they would provide. But think of it on a blockchain now. You are an SME. Tracy has a business. I have a business. All the data that you have, you put it on a blockchain. You, make, you start making it accessible. Start thinking of the power of a highly decentralized community putting all their data together and making it accessible while keeping privacy. No one can beat you. And now you can now start making it available and small businesses access it to start targeting key markets. The whole decentralization that is happening at the global scale and that blockchains enables true reliability and traceability is a paradigm shift. So you will own your data as, a, as an enterprise, and you will respect some basic rules of privacy, but still make it available on the net 
and commercialize those data based on privacy rule. But now if you have millions of entrepreneurs who do, who do it, no one, not the biggest company in the world can beat them. And that's why internet as a whole, as a whole and the internet of things in terms of connected objects, whether they're in your business or somewhere, etc. now you start accessing them, you use the web, that's where the paradigm shifts arrive. But you're right, and that's why I said cybersecurity is key as one of the five pillars, is until we get it right and until we manage to protect, we have a challenge. But that's also where blockchain comes again. That's why my African brothers and sisters need to get. Until we get that right, we'll be lagging behind. So 100%. But the knowledge has shifted location. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Um, I want to agree with uh, Mamadou on the, the five things that you are driving uh, at the frontier of digital revolution. Uh, and I strongly believe in, uh, in, in blockchain technology. However, I want to ask you a question. Many people actually believe and have the notion that cryptocurrency is uh, a highly risky, speculative, and very volatile venture. And as a matter of fact, uh, it does not lend uh, itself to any fundamentals in the market. Uh, if you look at, for example, the Bitcoin, it started off, I think, at $100 or even lower and rose to 20,000 US dollars without any underlying fundamentals in the rise of its value. How do you explain that cryptocurrency is not built on the pyramid scheme principle? It's not Ponzi as many people believe it is. What exactly drives, what are the fundamentals that drive the value of the currency? Okay, uh, that's a very good question. I'm going to bring you 25 years back, okay, when internet started. So, basically, there were all kinds of things on the net, and probably 95% collapsed. It's like that with any new trend. We know that not all cryptocurrency will effectively survive, but Bitcoin clearly is based on speculation. The, re the what makes it goes up is people anticipated that there's going to be other people who want to buy it. But Bitcoin changed the perception on the market. Is this whole decentralization that they're bringing, where I don't need a central entity to be able to transact with you, right? Now, clearly, the reason why it didn't have a big uptake in shops, etc., is because it might be worth twenty thousand dollars in December and could be worth 5,000 in June and back again at 15. Now, you do have crypto, and that's where we at Ubuntu Coin, we make it asset-backed. Now, you have a cryptocurrency backed by gold. Aren't you going to take it? You will, right? Certainly. Thank you. So it's, we can't put all cryptos in one, in one same basket. And uh, it's also the same story between, you know, I, I mentioned that yesterday, my, uh, MySpace and YouTube, right? You would always have, at the beginning of something, all kind of things emerging, but they have one key merit. They raise awareness, and it gets perfected over time, right? You wouldn't have, again, I mentioned that yesterday, but you wouldn't, remember the first Nokia, right? Would you have thrown it away because you couldn't send picture on it? No, it, it served a purpose at the time, right? So we are the beginning of a major, global transformation, and um, some have a big merit, is that if Bitcoin were not gaining value, would, have, would you have had interest in it? Would you have done some research on blockchain? Would you have kind of inquired on crypto? No. So at this point, they, they were very pioneer because for the first time in history, at least the way we know it, you could basically transact without a central bank and put value into something. Rory, and that's what changes. Do you want to comment as well? Yeah, maybe I can uh, just add to that. I think, um, I think you need to separate uh, fundamentally the difference between Bitcoin and, uh, the crypto and, uh, and blockchain, so the okay. cryptocurrency versus the underlying technology. Um, and I think Bitcoin is going through what we call a classic hub cycle right now. It's going up and down, people are excited, and it's, it's the usual cycle we follow, and it will settle down. But um, I think we also need to understand what, what cryptocurrency is not and what it is. 
What it is not is not a fiat currency. So fiat currency is any national government's currency of choice, which is open to manipulation and speculation. Um, and underlying Bitcoin uh, is the, the distributed ledger technology of blockchain, which means you can't really mess with it, which is great. And I think what we'll find is that the next big um, crisis, will crisis we have, instead of people flocking to gold, I think that they will probably flock to um, some blockchain technology, a cryptocurrency, and uh, for Mamadou's sake, I hope that it is Ubuntu coin. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, at the back there, the gentleman with his hand up in the yellow. Uh, yes, right there. Hello, yes, I'm Emmanuel Aukoya, and I run a company called Invest XT, and we are fortunate to have uh, three uh, nationals. I'm Nigerian, running in Accra, Ghana, and I have a Kenyan, Andrew Israel, and we have our CEO is Ghanaian. So now we are solving the problem of young Africans having money sometimes because. What really happens is we are innovators, we are, we are smart, so we try to make money. Unfortunately, we, we might start making money by 19 years old, before 30 or 29. We, the money we've made during that period, we, we must have spent it. And at 29, we start making a little bit straight, we want to do something much more tangible. If, if we're working or if we're doing business. But there's no money. And uh, we want to solve that problem whereby young, young people don't have money at a certain age, but they had money a period of time. And also, when young people want to invest in other countries, because me as a Nigerian, why not? I came to Accra, Ghana, and I discovered that their financial, their financial institution, before even starting this idea, when I came there, I discovered that their financial institution offer an interest rate that is very interesting. 20%, 20% some banks give 20%, 21% per annum. And in Nigeria, I know they give me 12%. And I want to invest, it's, it's, it's interesting. But I can't invest, that's one. Secondly, again, I'm not aware, it's not everybody that is aware, it's because me, I'm very interested, that's why I go searching. So we develop this investment, Tool is actually an investment tool that allows people to, uh, young people and anybody else to know about investment. We hope it's going to be across Africa very soon, but we've started off in Ghana. Now, my question goes to, first of all, the minister. Uh, considering the move of blockchain, and we young people were already tapping into it, we're already researching about it, and we might even put it in our solution. Wow, wow, we're considering putting it in our solutions. Um, and it's calling for policy regulation. How will you process your, your engineering process? How will you look at it so that you can start regulating us? Considering that in your staffing, the, the people that you have, they, are, they have, oh, let me not say little knowledge, but insufficient knowledge of blockchain at the moment. And we are moving fast. We want to put it on our solutions. And uh, secondly, um, what would you say was the innovative thing you did for your, still the minister, for your process, your engineering process, your first stage? What was innovative for your first stage? And if you put your, your whole process now on, on a benchmark, what would you say is, do you give to policy making, and what would you say to give to implementation realization? Because Unfortunately, in Nigeria, we have good policymakers. We make policies. But where we lack it is implementation. And we, young people, we are concerned about implementation because right now, I'm on my phone, I'm Facebooking, I'm WhatsApping, I'm, I'm on Instagram, I'm everywhere. How? Like, I'm finance also, I want to be like that. I want to be playing with my finance as I do with social media, as I increase my social awareness. I want to do that with my finance too. I don't know if more young people should do that. If they are not, we are not doing that, we should do that. And I want to do that. So regulation, how do you look into it? Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity.
thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, policy, uh, policy regulation to, um, to create space um, for the adoption of blockchain uh, in the African countries. Uh, I will try to respond not to be so sceptical, sorry, <laughs> because Tracy told us to be very positive here. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, what I know today that most of the African policy makers look at blockchain and cryptocurrency in a very, very sceptical way. Uh, you, I would say that maybe the, the feeling is uh, to be afraid of. Because we didn't understand. This is the, the reality. So far, African policymakers did not understand what is blockchain, how it works, the potential, and how blockchain can solve our problems macro problems, but as well as micro problems. And f Minister of Finance in general, they are risk adverse. They are not risk takers. Because they are the, the guardians of the macroeconomic stability. So I agree with my friend uh, OB that sometimes in the government, you are supposed to have crazy people. But uh, I believe that you can do crazy things when your, the basics and the fundamentals from a macroeconomic standpoint are already there and, that are, and are very consolidated. Otherwise, you can run into, into problems. But I believe that, in general, maybe to organize a, a campaign, an explaining campaign to Afghan policymakers of the potential of of blockchain. Then, when they will understand, maybe policy re regulation will um, uh, make the necessary adjustments. Can, can I jump in there very quickly? Because with the same people I was sitting, uh, that gentleman I was sitting at dinner with is one of the 50 innovators. And uh, one of the solutions they actually came up with around the table is that this group of 50 innovators should be an advisory service to government, these young people, that should sit uh, and, and be called in to government to advise around these policies because they acknowledge that they're the young people with the knowledge and a lot of the people that are in government um, are not as young as them and, and are not equipped uh, to be able to put the right policies in place because they don't understand the technology. And I thought that was a, a great suggestion that came out of the, the young people last night. Not sure what you think of that idea. No, exactly, Tracy. I believe that the world is moving at such high speed mm. that policy making cannot, can no longer be done in a box in your office. It doesn't work. The same way accountability and transparency is no longer an option, you have to do it yeah. because in the last 20 years you built uh, in purpose or by destruction, you built uh, assertive civil societies Today is impossible to structure or to make or to elaborate policy making in a box closed in your office. So I agree with you. Uh, dialogue with the, the innovators um, more and more is a must in policy making. Regarding implementation, I think it's the huge challenge in Africa. And I give you the AU example. Why? Um, Honorable President uh, Paul Kagame is leading this AU reform. Because for 20 years, for 25 years, lots of AU African Union reform has been put on the table and no implementation. There were 1,500 decisions, AU decisions, that nobody knew the status of the decision. So implementation is indeed a challenge. But implementation cannot depend on the capacity or the personality of a leader. It cannot. So it's time for, in, in Africa, we start building systems, process, and please allow me to quote Michael Barber, 
the one that created the first delivery unity in the Tony Blair government, you need to create routines. So P P P B E S C. So you meaning planning, programming, budgeting, and evaluation systems should become routine in African governance. Otherwise, I okay. Christina Duarte came to government as Minister of Finance. I'm a good girl. I'm uh, I'm a little bit uh, speedy. Uh, in 10 years, I changed the PFM reform. Depends on Christina Dwight's, uh, Christina Dwight's personality to make the reforms. It cannot be. It has to be more institutional. You need process, systems, rules, and routines. And once the government wins an election based on a program, in the following day, that program should be con considered a contract with civil society. And that government is supposed to deliver. It's not an option to deliver or not. Thank you. No. Uh, thanks a lot. I think uh, the, the minister has, a, has an important point. And what is nice is that everything you said about program, budgeting, planning, etc., you can put it on the blockchain, right? Yes. And it's interesting when you talk about awareness. But the best way to address governance in Africa is going to be blockchain. You can't cheat. What you say is scored, recorded. There is no other way. And to your point uh, about uh, policymakers, etc. Uh, as you know, uh, as a founder of 2.0, we we have engaged a lot with policymakers and promoted this uh, knowledge-based society. Um, yes, risk is one thing, and uh, you made an important point: uh, risk and rewards. Right? Do people realize that? Basically, if you introduce cryptocurrency, you are now being able to collect taxes. When you have 70% of the African economy that is black, gray, you name it, or dark gray, dark black, whatever, that is not accounted for. And we are crying every day because we don't have money, because we can't collect tax. And now comes a solution on a silver platter to introduce so that we can even charge 0.01% on any transaction. And the government will start having money and no excuses. Right? So yes, you can talk about risk. It's, but it's about how do I mitigate the risk and maximum my, regards, uh, my rewards while implementing what you said uh, on our minister by putting the right processes. And that's where the uh, Tracy suggestion of bringing technology people closer to policymakers is essential. Te technology will move much faster than law, always. And what, that's what saved them PESA to a certain extent, right? They were able to scale. And when policymakers realized that, oh, wait a minute, it's actually beneficiary for the people. Maybe the banks don't like it because it takes away some of their business, but the people benefited. And as long as policymakers will put the people first, then crypto is the next way to go. And you were talking about awareness, Honorable Minister, and I believe you were in the session yesterday at lunchtime when we introduced blockchain and discussed. Yeah. So you were, were you, first, were you... Uh, familiar with it before? And second, what was your impression after you had a bit more clarity about it? I would like the audience to, to, to hear from a, from a policy maker who, who has been sensitized to a certain extent. Uh, very quickly. I'm not familiar, but after yesterday's session, at least it opened, it opened the door in my mind. I believe that policy makers should look into it in a, with an open mind and see if provide solutions to some of the African challenges. I think we, we need to keep an open mind. Thank you very much. Uh, some quick things I might maybe add on is uh, the element of the responsibility of the youth to be involved in politics. Not, maybe not as politicians, but as this conversation about bringing policy makers, but why don't we just, just be involved? I mean, this, uh, I think, was the same conference we were in yesterday where we said, about 70% of the African youth is below 30%, right? The, clearly, the present and the future. Uh, we need to start being more involved, uh, holding our uh, policymakers more accountable without waiting for someone. I think that's one thing that the government of Rwanda is really encouraging the youth to do, to be involved in a young age. Uh, you know, be aware, learn about your rights, 
hold accountable your elected leaders. And I think the more you're involved, because I think it's also a part of the conversation we've been having lately, at least within these conferences, innovators complaining, you know, they're not doing this for us, right? Uh, the, the regulation is not, but be part of that. What can you do in your own rights and capacity to push forward the, 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 the regulation? Mobilize people, like-minded people. Um, mobilize, find time, look how you can meet that minister or that policymaker who's in charge of making that, explain to them, right? So I think there's this, I just want to talk about this element of be engaged early enough, don't be reactive and sit and complain, which is what uh, Lopez was also mentioning. Let's just, what can you do in your capacity to push forward your own agenda, especially if you think you can make a big difference for the people? Right. Thank you. I see it's actually time to wrap up, so I'm just going to ask uh, one last comment, suggestion um, from the panel, and then we're going to move into the workshops and the innovation labs, which is where we're going to engage you and your solutions and your ideas in a very practical, hands-on way. So final comments. I'll start off with you, Marmadou. Really? Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I, I will just put that quote out there, right? Um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I think um, luck is when opportunity meets preparation. Africa is, in, is facing a very unique opportunity that hasn't presented over decades, right? Uh, we have people who are prepared, who are knowledgeable. Let's let's not meet let's not miss that opportunity, right? And let's not be unlucky for once. Thank you. Good, excellent. Rory? So I think that um, uh, Africa is at an inflection point where we have an opportunity, a unique opportunity to change the narrative and change our trajectory. Um, and I think it's a, a once in a generation opportunity, maybe even a once in a multiple generation opportunity. So I think we must, um, we must stop making excuses and we must act now. There will, there, will, there will never be a better time than right now to change our collective future. And it is a collective future. More and more we are reliant on each other in the spirit of Ubuntu. So I think we need to stop thinking linear. We need to start embracing exponential. And I think in closing, we need to be bold. We need to think big. We need to start small, but we need to move fast. Great. Meters? Uh, from a financial institution uh, perspective, but also as a tech, uh, from a tech perspective and a youth perspective, I just want to call out to the financial institutions to believe in the young, young people, to believe in the youth, and to believe in the small guys, to believe in the farmers. I'll give a quick, a small number of idea how, I think there's no more, uh, I stand to be corrected, no more than two million formerly banked people in Rwanda. We've done 942, actually combining our two platforms in education and agriculture, we have over 1 million registered users, right? We've done that from the beginning of this year. Wow. Banking has been, people have been banking for how many years in Rwanda, I don't know. Just what tells you what Bank of Kigali Group has done is to believe in the young people, to believe in collaborative, inclusive effort, and really given opportunity to people with new ideas. Uh, my, my colleague here said it very well, uh, Playing itself is risky. I think uh, financial to those with the money and those with the decision making is authority need to believe in the young people. There's a lot of opportunity, a lot of room to make, to create value and to create wealth uh, for the African continent and for its people. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very quickly. Africa is facing a huge opportunity. I used to use this sort of comparison. You know that the tectonic plates, they move. And now, the worldwide tectonic plates are moving. When they move, meaning, meaning that Africa is facing a huge opportunity to become a global player. Second, this opportunity does not happen every year. It happened every 100 years. Uh, I believe that African policymakers already realize that in order to grab this opportunity, we need to leapfrog. 
And there is no way that Africa will be able to leapfrog without innovation. And they start being conscious of that. So it's the time maybe, maybe for the first time, there is awareness from the policy making standpoint, the need to establish a strategic alliance with innovation. And the AU reforms, again, are an example. A couple of weeks ago, most of the African countries signed the African Trade Agreement. Believe me, this is a milestone. And this is a window of opportunity for innovation in Africa. Because once we became, we close. We open our frontiers. You, little by little, became one market. This is a huge opportunity for innovation. Let's grab it and leapfrog. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd just like to thank all of the panelists for demonstrating uh, how and what can be achieved when you apply innovation to whatever sector you find yourself in. To the young innovators that are out there, you are the architects of Africa. We are cheering you along from the sideline. I think there's not a single person at the Africa Innovation Summit that isn't committed to uh, working alongside you and ensuring that you go to scale. So on that note, I'd like to ask you all to go to your various different workshops. Um, be as creative as you can be, come up with solutions, um, and we look forward to taking some of those solutions forward. Thank you.